So what I want to talk about today is how we should design distributed systems for the data center. The motivation for this area should be pretty familiar, uh, being as we are at the end of the data center section. Uh, even this slide uh, probably looks familiar. Uh, but today's applications are now distributed systems. They're running in data centers. The data center is a challenging environment to work with because it has a huge scale. There are thousands or tens of thousands of servers that we need to explicitly manage communication between. And at this scale, we have to deal with constant failures of the individual servers. So if the data center is where our communication, computation is being done, how do we program the data center? Because we have to deal with these communications and failure challenges, we need to use distributed algorithms that can tolerate failures and data inconsistencies. So to give a canonical example, there's Paxos is used for state machine replication and consensus. And this is something that we use to make multiple copies of important data in our data center and to keep them consistent and highly available even though some of the servers might have failed and some of and messages might be lost in the network. Traditionally, the way we design distributed systems is to do it completely independently of the network. And as a result, the designers have to treat the network as a black box, really as an adversary. They're making very conservative assumptions about it. So for example, a standard assumption that's used by algorithms like Paxos is that the network is asynchronous and lossy, that any packet might be lost, delayed arbitrarily, reordered, or maybe modified or mangled in some other way. And this is a totally reasonable design for the internet, where we know that all these things can happen, and there's not really a whole lot that we can do about it in general. But is this approach appropriate for the data center? The data center isn't a black box, and in fact, we know a, a, quite a bit about what the network in the data center looks like. In fact, the data center is really fundamentally different from the internet. We've seen a number of reasons already today. Uh, it's more predictable. We know the topology of the network, and we uh, often know the routes that packets are going to take. As a result, it's more reliable. We do have failures happening and packets being lost, but not nearly as often as on the internet. And most importantly, it's more flexible. It's run by a single organization, so we can imagine actually making changes to it without a really complex coordination process as needed on the internet. And modern networking hardware has advanced processing capabilities that are increasingly being exposed to administrators through technologies like software-defined networking. And this gives us a, an, an exciting opportunity for building distributed systems. What it means is that we can co-design distributed systems and data center networks. And in this talk, I'll be uh, talking about some of the advantages of doing so. So the, the key idea of our approach is to des both design the data center network around the applications that it's going to run and to design the distributed applications around the properties that the data center network has. And this is an iterative approach, so we'll be introducing new primitives into the network layer so that we can take advantage of them in the distributed system. In this talk, I'm going to focus on a concrete instantiation of this approach, how to use this idea to improve the performance of, of replication using a, a co-design of two, of two ideas, a new replication protocol called speculative Paxos and a new network primitive called mostly ordered multicast. And we'll see that this approach gives us great performance benefits. It'll give us cons uh, considerably higher throughput and considerably lower latency than the conventional approach. So in the rest of this talk, I'll give a brief uh, background on how state machine replication, what state machine replication is used for and how it's done today. And then I'll describe the two new mechanisms we're using, mostly ordered multicast and speculative Paxos. And we'll wrap up with some evaluation uh, that demonstrates the performance <coughs> benefits I just mentioned. So state machine replication is one of the classic building blocks in distributed systems. We, ex we examples of this, uh, of, of, use, of implementing a replicated state machine using consensus protocol are algorithms like Paxos or view stamp replication. And these really are now a mainstay of data center applications. We use them both in critical management services like Google's Chubby or Apache Zookeeper, these are services that are used to coordinate other systems in the data center, uh, and therefore we need to keep them highly available. And they're also used as a basis for persistent and highly available storage in distributed databases like Google Spanner or the HStore Research Project. And so what we're going to do is make multiple copies of a replicated service and use a consensus protocol to provide strongly consistent or linearizable replication meaning that every replica agrees on the same set of operations that they're going to execute in the same order, 
and that this happens even when up to half of the replicas have failed, and even when messages are lost or delayed in the network. We'll use this approach to improve the performance of Paxos. So in order to do this, we first need to understand how the traditional Paxos algorithm works and what the performance bottlenecks are. Also, as someone with a PhD in distributed systems, I'm required to explain this in every talk that I give. <laughs> So in Paxos, we have a set of clients submitting operations to a group of replicas. And one of these replicas is designated as a leader and is responsible for ordering requests. Of course, the leader can fail, and we have a protocol for assigning a new one if necessary. Uh, but we won't be talking about that uh, right now. So when a client sends a request, it goes to the leader, which assigns it a sequence number, and sends it to the other replicas. The other replicas send an acknowledgment to the leader indicating that they're prepared to execute the operation, and this is much like two-phase commit. And once the leader has heard from a majority of replicas, it executes the request and notifies all of the uh, other participants of the outcome. The key uh, features here are that no request is executed before a majority of replicas has seen it, which ensures that the system is fault tolerant, and that all requests are serialized through the leader, which ensures that they are going to be executed in the same order. Looking at this, we can see two of the main performance characteristics already. Latency is determined by the four steps to this protocol. There are four message delays. And we'll see that we're able to improve on that by reducing the number of message delays. And in terms of throughput, the primary limiting factor is the number of messages processed by the leader, which becomes the bottleneck replica. Here you can see it's processing messages uh, from, every, from every replica and sending messages to every replica. So we're going to improve on this performance uh, using uh, mostly ordered multicast and speculative Paxos. The, how are we going to do this? Well, we saw that in Paxos, we used a leader to order the requests. And what we're going to ask instead is, can we use the network to do this? So specifically, what we're going to do is design a new network primitive that we're calling mostly ordered multicast, or MOM, which gives us a new best effort ordering property. And then we're going to design an incredibly efficient replication protocol called speculative Paxos that relies on the ordering properties of, of MOM in the normal case to give us single round trip performance. What we'd like to get out of the network is a consistent ordering of concurrent messages, meaning that if we've got multiple clients sending requests to the same group of replicas, and one replica receives message A followed by message B, then all the other replicas should receive A and then B. And if we had this, we could use this to order requests and eliminate a lot of complexity to the protocol. Now, to actually achieve this reliably would be really hard. Uh, it's a problem that's equivalent to consensus. It's nearly impossible to get it right in the event of network failures and all the other things that can happen in the data center. And if we could do it, we could eliminate the need for Paxos entirely. So we can't quite go that far. But what we're going, what we're going to do instead is provide a best effort uh, property, meaning that this property holds most of the time. The network will be allowed to violate it occasionally, say if there are failures, and that's going to make it practical to implement. But we're still able to take advantage of it in order to uh, provide better performance. And I should note that although this property is not a strict guarantee, it's still something that's really not provided by existing multigas systems. So to see why this is, we can look at why reorderings tend to happen in, in, in the network. Uh, and the reason for that is that there are different path lengths from clients to certain replicas. Uh, so here is an example of a data center network, a very small one, obviously. We've got three clients and, th and three senders and three receivers communicating via a network of, of switches. And when the, when the client on the left sends a message to uh, the replicas, it's going to take the shortest path to each of them. And that's a path of length two to one of the replicas and of length four to the others. So one replica will receive it first. And if the client on the right is sending a message, that also takes a shorter path to one of the replicas uh, and a longer path to the others. So it's not too hard to imagine that if these messages were being sent at about the same time, some of the replicas would receive the red message first, and some of them would receive the blue message first, which is exactly the sort of ordering violation uh, we'd, we'd like to avoid. The approach we're going to take uh, with, with mom is basically that we're going to route multicast messages to a root switch that's equidistant from all of the receivers in order, in order to equalize the path lengths. So when the client on the left sends this message, it's going to be sent up first to the root switch and then back down, rather than taking the shortest path to the replica on the left. And what that means is that uh, for certain uh, 
messages, the uh, latency will be increased, but not by a significant factor. And we'll see that this is able to provide us better overall latency in com combination with our new protocol. We've actually developed a spectrum of design options to implement MOMS, giving us a sequence of increasingly better ordering properties in exchange for requiring more support out of the network. I'll be giving the highlights now, and our paper describes in detail what's needed to implement these in terms of addressing, routing, failure recovery, and load balancing. Our first option is topology-aware multicast, where we'll direct all packets first through a randomly chosen root switch. And this makes the path lanes roughly equal, which we'll see is very effective at reducing the rate of reordering by a couple of orders of magnitude, but reordering can still happen. Another cause for ordering violations is that some links might be congested, and this can cause packets to be delayed. So our second option is avoids this by assigning MOM packets strictly higher priority using existing quality of service mechanisms. And this has some obvious trade-offs, but they're not serious for this environment and this application, because we imagine that this traffic is primarily being used for low volume coordination traffic rather than bulk data transfer. And finally, our third option is called network serialization, which is to say we're routing all packets through a single root switch. And this requires additional support from the network controller to designate this switch, to replace the switch during failures, and to handle load balancing. But it can ensure that packets are never going to be reordered, except when they are lost, say in the event of failures. And this gives us a best effort ordering property that's going to be very strong in practice. Now, with this new primitive, we're going to design speculative Paxos, which is a new state machine replication protocol that can be used for the same purposes as Paxos. It, it in the normal case, it relies on mom to order requests. But I should note that that's only required for a performance. If there are ordering violations, the protocol remains correct and provides the same safety and liveness properties that we're accustomed to with Paxos. The speculative Paxos protocol itself is, very, is quite straightforward in the normal case. Uh, when clients send requests, they're going to send them directly to all of the replicas using our mom primitive. And upon receiving this requ these requests, each of the replicas is going to assume that the other replicas were likely to have received the same request in the same order, so they're going to immediately speculatively execute the request and reply to the client. When they reply to the client, they're going to include a hash of their state uh, along with the result, which the uh, client will, ch will use to check whether it's received matching responses uh, from all of the replicas. And in fact, in this case, it needs to get matching responses from a super quorum of three quarters of the replicas for reasons I'll discuss briefly later. But if it does find matching responses, then it knows that the request succeeded, and it can return immediately to the client. And with this, we can see that we've improved on the performance of Paxos. Before, we had a, a protocol that required four message delays, and here we've reduced it to two, uh, so, which will give us uh, about the improvement in latency that you would expect. And we've also eliminated the bottleneck uh, of the, that was the leader, um, which was previously the limiting factor for throughput. Now we have each replica processing only one incoming message and one outgoing message, and it's hard to do much better in a system with any useful properties. <laughs> so just to uh, summarize, the, there are th the three key ideas here are that speculative execution, uh, checking for matching responses using uh, the hash of of st the state that's in the response and requiring a super quorum of responses uh, before accepting a, re a response. So in order to make this work, we had to use speculation. And that means that replicas are executing requests before they know the definite ordering of operations. And that means that they might have to roll back operations, which does require application support. Fortunately, this is usually practical for the kinds of applications we want to replicate in the data center. We've implemented several, including a lock service and a storage system, without too much trouble. But one fat property that's important is that clients always know for sure that their requests succeeded because they can compare the responses from the replicas and only take matching ones. So the clients don't need to speculate, which is important because providing support for that would be a lot harder in a distributed system. And our use of speculative execution here is similar to the Zizba Byzantine fault tolerance protocol. Now, of course, all I've talked about is what happens if replicas do execute requests in the same order. What if they don't, which could always happen uh, because our mom primitive is only a best effort property, not a strict guarantee. And in fact, uh, given the protocol we've seen so far, 
Replicas might not even know that they've executed requests in different orders because they're not coordinating with each other in the normal case. So in order to make sure the replicas do wind up in the same state, every few seconds or every few thousand requests, they run a synchronization protocol where they check what their current state is. If they detect a divergence, they run a reconciliation protocol. And this looks a lot like the slow path in standard Paxos or ViewStamp replication. The replicas pause their processing, elect a leader, they exchange their logs to see what they've executed before, and the leader will decide on a definitive ordering. The leader then sends this re request back to, all, this, this log back to all of the replicas, which will install it, possibly rolling back requests. And this is something that doesn't have to happen too often because we're getting this best effort ordering property out of the mom primitive. I should also note that this is where the requirement for a super quorum of three quarters of the replicas rather than uh, just over a half on the fast path comes in. We need this in so that the new leader will always be able to ensure, will always be able to figure out which request succeeded even if half of the replicas had failed. And this is the same uh, kind of reasoning that we had in fast Paxos. So finally, I want to talk about the performance of this approach. Uh, we evaluated this primarily in our local uh, test bed, where we, we built a simulated data center network using a 12-switch fat tree topology. Uh, the client Tor links are 1 gig Ethernet, and the core links are 10 gig. And we're running a, a th a three replicas and a group of clients. Uh, these are uh, servers that are uh, four or five years old. And for scalability experiments, we also used a simulator that uh, implements a, a 2,500 host, uh, 119 switch data center network, and uses a traffic model based on uh, measurements of Microsoft's data centers. Let me start with uh, the high level benefit, uh, which is that uh, spec speculative Paxos will give us an improvement in both latency and throughput. So this graph is showing latency with better being up and throughput with better being to the right. Uh, Paxos is, our implementation of Paxos in this environment is able to give us about 30,000 operations per second uh, and a latency of about 200 microseconds. Uh, speculative Paxos is able to give us three times that throughput as well as 40% lower latency. And that's a nice result. But what's really interesting is to compare it to uh, some previous work. So uh, previous work has generally focused on improving one or the other of latency and throughput. So uh, fast Paxos is a latency optimized protocol. Despite the name, it doesn't actually uh, improve throughput by any significant amount. Uh, and speculative Paxos is able to give even better latency uh, than fast Paxos while also improving throughput. There's also a throughput optimized protocol, Paxos with batching, uh, which is able to give us similar gains in throughput, but at the cost of, of much higher latency. And this is actually a implementation of batching that's designed to optimize for latency. And all of these experiments are running on our emulated data center network with the network serialization variant of MOMS. <coughs> now, speculative Paxos performance depends pretty heavily on MOMS, as you would expect because of this uh, co-design approach. When ordering violations occur, we have to run this expensive reconciliation protocol. So in this experiment, we're simulating reorderings and showing the resulting throughput level. Now, as you can see, uh, speculative Paxos is going to outperform Paxos until we get to a reordering rate of about 0.1%. It might be possible to improve this by optimizing the reconciliation protocol, which we haven't uh, put a lot of effort into right yet. So the obvious question is, do our MOM mechanisms provide the low rate of ordering violations that we need? And this table is summarizing the re results of a, of a large set of experiments uh, on both our test bed and the simulated data center network. There are a lot more details, a lot of graphs in our paper, many of which are hard to read. Um, and these look at varying ranges of MOM traffic levels, background tra traffic network utilization, and so on. The first thing I want to note about this is that regular multicast provides reordering rates that are over 1%, which means that it really wouldn't be suitable to use this uh, with speculative Paxos. Our topology-aware MOM approach gives us uh, reordering rates of 0.001% to 0.05%, making it sufficient in smaller networks, but it begins to approach the point in larger networks and high traffic rates where spec Paxos isn't is no longer beneficial. 
But with the network serialization approach, we see essentially no reorderings at all because ordering violations happen only during failures. And finally, we use speculative Paxos to build an, an application, uh, a key value store that supports distributed transactions using two-phase commit and optimistic concurrency control. You could describe this as vaguely inspired by Google's spanner system. And we've used this to run a synthetic workload that's derived from the retwist Twitter clone. The first thing I want to note about this is that less than 250 lines of code needed to be added in order to support rollback. So although speculative Paxos requires additional support from applications and might not be suitable for all applications, there's a class of applications where it's quite feasible. Our goal in this was to maximize the number of transactions per second that the system can execute within a 10 millisecond SLO. And I should note that each transaction here includes a number of replicated operations. As you can see, speculative Paxos is able to execute considerably more transactions within this latency budget than the other approaches. And finally, to, to summarize, we, I've shown a new approach to building distributed systems based on co-designing them with a data center network. I, I argue that this can, make, can give us considerable benefits in terms of performance uh, as well as other desirable properties. We've seen that it can be, give us dramatic performance and property, pro improvements for state machine replication by combining the MOM network primitive with a speculative Paxos replication protocol. But I want to emphasize that this is really only the first step. It's only beginning to scratch the surface of what we can do by co-designing distributed systems and data center networks. And our group is currently looking at a lot of other exciting possibilities in this space. Thank you. Uh, Robert Escriva, Cornell University. So when you were describing Paxos, you didn't mention anything about ballots, acceptors, and uh, it looks like your protocol completes in exactly one finite number of hops, uh, which contradicts the famous FLP result, and uh, you can't have it sure. run in time, finite time. And so absent all these things that make Paxos correct, what is it about speculative Paxos that makes it correct, because be, with Paxos you have state machine replication. Everything is safely agreed upon. It's put in one slot, it's executed exactly once. Here you're executing things, you're rolling them back, and the, the state machine replication paper from Fred doesn't actually describe that at all. It's right. a strict sequence. So uh, can you give us a little more insight about why we should uh, put our put our code on speculative Paxos. Yeah, sure. So what I've actually been describing would be more accurately described as uh, view stamp replication or the multi-Paxos variant of uh, Paxos where we're using a single, a single leader that's elected that processes a series of requests. And the properties that uh, speculative Paxos is providing are the same for clients in, the, in this environment, namely that it's providing uh, linearizable uh, operations uh, when there are uh, when, when, when there are fewer than F, F failures out of two F plus one replicas, and it make, makes progress under the uh, same set of uh, conditions as Paxos. Okay, um, and you have something that enforces the one leader constraint? Because with Paxos, you can have a number of leaders going on at the same time, and uh, you don't just have one leader. Uh, yes, that, that's correct. I mean, it's possible for there to be multiple concurrent leaders, but only one of them will be able to successfully uh, complete transactions. Okay, thank you. Let's do round robin. Mohsen Ali from University of Southern California. So I was wondering in the brief time period when uh, replicas have diverged and the reconciliation protocol has yet, is yet to be run, how do you ensure correctness in that period of time? Uh, how do we ensure correctness in the period between, b before the replication, before the reconciliation before protocol Before rec the reconciliation yes. and after the divergence. So the key, the key approach there is that, uh, that all the requests, all the responses from the uh, from the replicas will include a hash of their state, uh, which will be different in the cases of all of the replicas because they have executed different operations. And the clients, upon seeing that, will know not to accept the, res the, the results. So clients will never see the, if will never accept the outcome of an inconsistent group of replicas. And of course, this will get resolved on reconciliation later. Thank you. Next. Hello, uh, Louis Pedrosa, University of Southern California. Uh, continuing with the question from my colleague Mosin, so I can see that in the, in, under similar circumstances, 
uh, if they do, if the replicas do diverge, basically it blocks out any client from being able to get their transactions done at that point. Is there some sort of relationship between how frequently you do um, reconciliation? Is there some, some kind of strict bound that you have to uh, require for the system not to block completely? Because I could imagine once a small divergence happens, the network could go into disarray very quickly. I mean, yes, so it is true that if there is a, an ordering violation, then, requ then requ the system will pause until a reconciliation completes. So you can imagine that uh, you know, the time to complete a reconciliation uh, and the, you know, can't, can't be um, longer than the expected time between ordering violations. We've seen in practice that they can be quite, that they, they can be quite different. Thank you very much. Dave Anderson, Carnegie Mellon. Um, I'm going to ask the predictable question. You probably have a backup slide. It's so predictable. Um, so at SOSP two years ago, we had this egalitarian Paxos thing yes. that does well in the common case that messages arrive at the replicas in the same order and there are no conflicts, conflicting updates for keys. And you seem to just present something that does well in the case that it does that. So how do I understand the difference between MOM and multicast, but how do these two Paxos protocols compare and do you have something that shows the way you're better? Well, sure. This, uh, so th this is a protocol that's really optimized for the data center case, where at the single data center case, whereas egalitarian Paxos is looking at uh, is looking at the multi data center case as well. And uh, one key difference is that we aren't assuming a model where we know anything about the commutativity of operations or which operations conflict. We're assuming that all operations will conflict. Thank you. Last question. Uh, Edward Dremel from Cornell. I'm uh, wondering about the trade-off between using the multi, uh, the, the mostly ordered multicast and network congestion. It seems like in order to do that, you purposely add more congestion to the network by sending everything through those uh, core switches, even for routes that didn't need to go through them. I assume that this trade-off is worth it, but you didn't show any graphs or experiments. Can you, can you explain how that um, affects, uh, how, how you need to make that decision? Sure, so we have in fact uh, done some simulations on this. Uh, we haven't found really to, it to have a, a measurable effect on the increase in network congestion uh, for two reasons. One reason is that we're primarily sending uh, packets along paths that they're generally going to take anyway. So we are causing some requests to take longer paths, but uh, you know, we are only sending them to the least common ancestor switch of, of, the, uh, of, of the multicast group, which would be necessary anyway. It's just an additional, uh, some, some additional traffic on the downward path. And the other assumption that we're making is that we're using this to coordinate uh, rep replication protocols, uh, and this doesn't make up the, a, the majority of traffic in the data center. Uh, we're not using this for bulk data, and this approach wouldn't be suitable uh, for for that kind of um, for that kind of application. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's thank the speaker and then congratulate on his best paper.